Welcome back. You're going to love this. This is great stuff. Perceptual organization. When we started talking about vision, I told you that there's two processes that psychologists talk about, sensation and perception. Sensation is the recording of information. It's like the taking of a picture. Uh, perception is understanding that sem sensory information, interpreting it, adding meaning to it. And often that involves us using our brains to interpret the sensory information, which means that all of our past experiences and expectations about the world are going to influence what we perceive. So when we perceive information, when we organize it, we add information to it. And so we perceive things that are a little different from what's actually there. Uh, in the picture that's on your far left, if you spend a lot of time around cattle, you might notice that that's a face of a cow. Here's one ear, there's another ear, here's a nose, there's two eyes, right? You probably didn't see the cow before, but now that you know it's a cow's face, you can see it. Your knowledge is changing your perception. In the middle is what's called the face-vase illusion. You can see that as a black vase that's symmetric in front of a white background. But if you look at it again, you can also see two faces, the profiles of two faces. And the two faces are looking at each other. So it's two white faces in front of a black background, the face-vase illusion. On the one on the far right, you may have seen this before. On the right end of the tool or whatever it is, it looks like there are two prongs, but if you count the number of prongs, there are three. Uh, what we perceive can be different from what's there. And why is that? What's the language that psychologists use to talk about that? Well, they use the term top-down and bottom-up processing. So, and I like to think of them as my brain's on top and my sensory systems are below, right? My nose, my eyes, my mouth, they're below my brain. So bottom-up means taking the sensory information that comes into my eyes and my nose and my mouth and my skin and sending that up to the brain to be interpreted. Sensation. Top down is when I use my brain, my knowledge of the world, to interpret what my eyes have recorded or what my nose has recorded or what my mouth has recorded. It turns out if you look in the brain, there are 10 times, 10 times more top-down connections than there are bottom-up. In other words, about 10% of our world is a recording of what we think is out there, and the other, you could say 90% or order of magnitude more, comes from our analysis of what we think is there. Um, some people talk about this in terms of perceptual sets, so for example, um, you know, the Eiffel Tower, Paris, who doesn't love Paris? Now, a lot of people say they love Paris in the springtime. And um, did you notice anything in that last slide? Look what it says in that triangle, Paris in the springtime, right? But look at it again. It's Paris in the, the spring. Paris in the, the spring. Where did that second the come from? It was there all the time, trust me. We just don't see it because we don't expect to see it. Isn't that wild that we don't see things that we don't expect to see? Another thing where um, perception sort of changes sensation or the top-down processing changes our interpretation of the sensory information is context. I can show you exactly the same stimulus, but surround it by different things, and that stimulus will change right in front of your eyes, as it does so here. So let's look at what I've got here. I've got A, B, C, D, E, F, easy, and 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Uh, really clear, no ambiguity there, right? Except that the letter B and the number 13 are identical. They're the same shape. But no one looks at this display and says A, 13, C, D, E, F, and 10, 11, 12, B, 14. Nobody. That's because the surround changes our perception. So here's another example of it. 
Um, uh, actually, this is something slightly different. Um, one of the things that our visual system has to do is figure out what's in front and what's in back. So I am in front of the wall behind me. I am figure and that is ground. The face vase illusion tells us that we can flip figure and ground back and forth. Here's another uh, figure ground illusion on the left. You can interpret it as a series of people walking downstairs or as a series of white arrows going up and down. Do you see that? Either black figures going downstairs or white arrows going past. Yeah. The cow, you know, that cow figure. So you could say it's a face vase cow. My suspicion is you're seeing something that's been edited, but wouldn't that be amazing if there were a cow with a face face on it? Do you guys remember this? There was a viral moment in social media where people were arguing about what color a dress was. The dress. Some people look at the dress that I have here and see a white and gold dress. Other people look at the dress and see a black and blue dress. How is that possible? How can groups of people look at the same dress and see it so differently? Well, it turns out that that difference reflects the assumptions or expectations that your visual system has. So here are some graphs, I'll explain them, on what's associated with people seeing the dress as black and blue or white and gold. People are much more likely to perceive the dress as white and gold if they think the dress is being shown in a shadow. If they think the dress is in a shadow, they see it as white and gold. But if they think the dress is in direct light, not a shadow, if you think it's in direct light, then it appears to be black and blue. Now, it's not clear from the picture whether the dress is in shadows or not. Your visual system, the top-down processes, need to fill that information in. And how you fill it in determines what you perceive. Um, another thing that varies, uh, co-varies with perception of the dress's color, is whether you think the lighting is natural lighting, outdoor lighting, or artificial light, like the lights that's in light fixtures all in every building that we're in these days. If people think that the dress is outdoors in natural light, they're much more likely to perceive it as being white and gold than, then, than if they think the dress is indoors in artificial light, because the assumption that you make about the lighting determines your perceived color of the dress. I want to mention briefly some rules that a group of psychologists called Gestalt psychologists develop to try to figure out how it is we interpret ambiguous information. And I'm going to stick with visual examples. So we have to take patches of light and group them into meaningful pieces. Like you see this flailing thing and this flailing thing. You have to group it together to say, oh, those are parts of Maggie's body. They don't belong to different people. That's what I mean by grouping. The Gestaltists did a lot of studying on this and they found that, well, we're more likely to group things together that are near each other. That's called proximity. We're more likely to group things together if they look similar. Not surprisingly, that's called similarity. We're more likely to group things together if they touch each other, if they're connected, connectedness. And we're more likely to um, perceive things as changing continuously rather than abruptly. So for example, um, on the bottom left-hand corner, I perceive that as one horizontal line with a sort of a sine wave on top of it, but I didn't, that's not necessarily the way it could be interpreted. There are many other ways to interpret it. We also tend to close things together or group things together that make a closed shape. So in this graph, the four line segments there, I group them together as a square, even though there's no corners. Uh, I also see a panda bear, even though the panda has no back, I automatically group them together. The Gestaltists said that we also tend to perceive things in the simplest possible way. So I've got some uh, examples here of subjective contours. Uh, the argument would be, let me pick um, option C. 
I see this as a white sphere with these little cones coming out of it. A gestaltist would say that that's a simpler interpretation than a bunch of black clone, cones just floating in space. Uh, here are some real world examples of gestalt grouping principles and actions. Let's start with these um, signs in the left hand side. If I, the things that are in, have a darker background are grouped together and the words that are on a lighter background are grouped together. You can play with that, right? So you could take the four words here, which are stop, peace, war, now. You could draw a line and, and make the background on stop and war be light and the background on peace now be dark and I'll group together stop, war, peace, now. Or you could change the backgrounds so that the words stop and peace are both on a white background and the words war and now are both on a dark background. And now the same sign reads stop, peace, war, now. Obviously, two completely different meanings. Um, I love the photograph in the middle. It's a great grouping by similarity. When you first look at it, it's hard to see anything other than a sidewalk. And then you realize, oh no, there's a man standing there uh, with stripes on him. We just miss it. Okay, come right back and we'll do our last segment on how our perceptual systems deal with the fact that the world is always changing.